Hey, welcome to Family Church. We are a diverse, spirit-filled, life-giving church. Healing hurts, building relationships, and developing leaders. My name is Ashley, and I am so excited that you've connected to our page today. Be sure to grab a notebook, pen, and paper, your phone, however you want to take notes, and get ready for today's message. So we've been in this series on grief, and I got to say, I am really surprised at the amount of feedback that we've been getting about this series, the amount of people who have been touched significantly by grief, even in, like, recent, uh, we got one report of someone who, like, had been, something happened years and years and years ago, and it was just now through this series that their marriage is actually getting better because they're having some tools to talk about the hurt and the pain that they never dealt with years ago. You see, what, we've under, what we can understand is that grief comes. Yeah. Grief happens. Mm -hmm. Grief is the natural human response to loss. Loss of a job, loss of a pet, loss of a loved one, loss of a house, loss of income. Whatever that loss is, Grief can come. It's an emotional response to loss, something being taken away from us. And grief can either creep in slowly, like real little each day, and you didn't, you didn't even realize that you're starting to act any different. It can creep in like that. Or it can just hit you like a tidal wave out of nowhere. Yeah. This one time, we were down at the beach with the kids. We we're all playing in the Well, Cindy wasn't playing in the waves. Cindy wasn't playing waves. But we were playing in the waves. I was tanning. She was tanning. Reading, <laughs> reading a book, tanning. <laughs> And I was in the ocean with the kids, and, and you know like when you're out just deep enough that you can jump up with the waves and just kind of ride them up and down? So like we're doing that, we're having fun, and out of nowhere, a tsunami-sized wave. I'm not even joking. This thing was huge. I was facing the kids, they're in front of me, so the ocean's behind me, the shores, smacks me in the back of the head. Bow! Knocks my hat off, I wear a hat in the water because I'm bald. Have his hat on, knocks my, <laughs> knocks, knocks my hat off, knocks my Oakley sunglasses off my face to the bottom of the ocean, gone. gone. Could, I mean, listen, I dove under the water trying to find him as fat. Gone. My Oakleys are gone. And grief can happen the same way. Grief. <laughs> You're going to like this. <laughs> Grief can smack you in the face and knock the joy right out your smile. Yeah. Grief can knock you in the face and knock your joy to the pits of depression. Yeah. And it can take a long time to find that joy and dig it back up again. Yep. Right? Grief can come in like that. One minute you're enjoying yourself, then the next minute you feel like, I lost something. How am I? Like, what's my new normal going to be like? What's my new life going to be like without this missing piece? Right here. <laughs> so today we're talking about moving on. How do we move on? What is the turning point that happens in your life to get you to move on? How do you get past the pain of this grief? In Isaiah 61, 1, 2, 3, it says, The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me. Because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the, from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of heaviness. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. We're talking about this great exchange. He says, I will take your hurt, your pain, your grief, your mourning, yeah. and I will give you joy. Mm -hmm. There has to be this great exchange. And the thing I love about this, he says, I'm doing all this because then you will be called oaks of righteousness, planted of the Lord. Watch this. For the display of the Lord's splendor. What we need to understand is that we are part of the kingdom of God. And in our society, it's very hard for us to understand 
kingdom principles mm -hmm. because we're not from a kingdom. We don't live that way. Yeah. But, but understand this about a kingdom. If you want to know if a kingdom is happy and healthy, you can't look at the king. You have to look at the people. If you want to know if a king is a loving, caring, prospering, providing king, look at the wealth of the people. Yes. If the people are poor and distraught and upset and angry, they don't have a good king. They have a tyrant. Mm -hmm. God is saying that he wants to take away pain and mourning and sorrow and give you joy. Take your spirit of heaviness and give you a garment of praise because it's good for the kingdom. The happiness of the people is a reflection of a good king. We have to believe that we serve a good God. A good God. Listen, I got to stand up for this. And hey, listen, either God is good or he's not. Yeah. Yep. If we're going to say God is good all the time, all the time, God is good, then, it can, then he can never be bad. Because if God to ever be bad or do bad, then he's not good all the time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yep. So listen, we got to get to the place where we understand God is good even when life is bad. Yeah. Amen. God is good even when I'm going through something. Yeah. God is good regardless of my situation. Mm -hmm. God is good all the time. So then why do bad things happen? Because we live in a sinful, fallen world. There's an enemy who prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. So all you got to say to him is this. No, you may not. No, you may not. Seeking whom he may. No, you may not. No, you may not. You can't come to my house. You can't come here. Don't bring sickness here. Don't bring disease here. Come on, somebody. God says he wants to bring these things into your life, but we got to start at this place where we believe God is good. Yeah. There can, this can't be this bipolar God. No. We can't serve a bipolar God. We cannot believe that God is good except when he's trying to teach me a lesson. Let me, let's just look at this. Yeah. My son is eight. Our son is eight. I want to teach my son how to cook. Right? He's at that spot where he's like, you know, I'm hungry. I said, so cook yourself something. I don't know how. Well, you're going to learn today. <laughs> now listen, how messed up, how abusive would it be if I said, now, Poppy, listen, don't touch the stove when it's hot. So I'm going to teach you a lesson, okay? I'm going to turn the stove on hot. I'm going to take his hand. And I'm going to... Ah! Ah! My head! Now, son, do you know why I did that to you? <laughs> because I love you. Because you're a psycho. And now I'm going to bandage your hand, and I'm going to hit. You need to be institutionalized. <laughs> but we believe in a God who can do that? Yeah. No. No. That's not good. Yeah. Let me show you how it went down. Let me show you how your pain and your hurt went down. God says, don't touch the stove. Don't touch the stove. But why, God? Because I told you not to trust me. Don't touch yourself. It's going to hurt. Yeah. And I want to protect you from that. But guess what I'm not going to do? I'm not going to fly down from heaven on my magic carpet and stop you. Yeah. Because you have free will. Mm -hmm. And guess what you did? I know better than God. And God's like, I really didn't want you to do that. I tried. Now that you did that, let me wrap that up yeah. and heal you and comfort you. Mm -hmm. If you don't see God that way, you have a misconception of who God is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If God could ever get angry at you, you are full of pride. You are full of pride. Because you're saying your ability to misbehave and put God in a bad mood is more powerful than the blood of Jesus that washed you white as snow and cleansed you from all unrighteousness. Yeah. It's to say you're more powerful than God, that your bad behavior is more powerful than the blood of Jesus. Yeah. You ain't gonna hear that at every church. Sorry, you ain't gonna hear that. Anyway, that wasn't in our notes. That's free of charge. We must be working towards a turning point. 
And how do you get towards the turning point? We must rest in the goodness of God to aid us in that great escape exchange. It is an escape. It is escape. Exchange. But the notes say exchange. <laughs> now this rest will be different for everybody because grief is as individual as the people who are experiencing the grief. Yes. For some, the turning point comes after spending time in the word studying your situation. I think one thing that is important is to know that whatever situation you're in, it's in the Bible. It may not be specific, like you look in the Bible and so and so and so and so went through this, but whatever your category is, whether it's marriage, children, loneliness, depression, it's in the Bible and God has a word for you. For others, it comes to the point, it comes when you get to the point where you can show gratitude for the things you have instead of the things you've lost. Talk about, talk about um, like when, when we were in this spot where I'm, when I'm blaming you mm -hmm. for the loss of our child and there's this pain, talk about that time that you had driving the kids to school. And so for me, it would be yet another one where it comes with just spending time in prayer and aligning your thoughts with God. We were at the, I would say probably the worst point to date um, in our marriage at that point and it just felt heavy. Like when he speaks about a spirit of heaviness, it just felt heavy, almost like I couldn't breathe. And if you know me, I tend to be very smiley all the time. And at the time, I felt almost like I had lost my smile. Like I couldn't even fake it at that point. And every day, I would drive my kids to school. And it was a half hour drive, because they were in a private school at the time. So the way there, you know, you play with the kids, talk to them, whatever, drop them off. And on the way back, I would spend the entire half hour from the door of the school to the door here at the church, because I was working, uh, praying. Praying over the situation, praying over our family. And not in like a begging God to do something type way. I was, for the most part, thanking him for what he had already given me, my kids. And then just speaking peace over our family and peace over the situation and everything. And then one day I realized that it had been a few days, I mean, we're talking months, like six, seven months later. It had been a few days since I had felt that pressing need to pray the whole time. And I realized that I had reached a point at that point that regardless of how this panned out, that I was at peace with myself, at peace with what, with following what God had told me to do, and that I knew that he was gonna be there for me. So you have to realize, she got to this place where she experienced this peace and this, I'm okay with whatever, and I hadn't changed yet. Yeah. It, it, she didn't feel that peace because I was like, honey, I'm sorry, let's make this better, let's work this mm -hmm. out. I'm still checked out. Mm -hmm. I'm still checked out, I'm still done. Yeah. She came to this place in her own mind, in her own heart, that I am okay, mm -hmm. I am secure. She would even, here's another tool, she would, um, she had this specific song, this worship song that she found during this time, and she would put it on, on her phone, on her side of the bed, on repeat, and it would play as she fell asleep and play all night long. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I mean, seriously, to the point where I'm like, dude, <laughs> look, can we have a playlist? Can we have more than just this one song over and over and over again? Like, dear God. And still, I hadn't changed. Yeah. It wasn't something that I was ready to get over and be past. I was still hurting and I'm still blaming her for this. Go ahead, read this verse. In 2 Samuel 12, 8, 18 through 20, it says, On the seventh day, the child died. David's attendants were afraid to tell him that the child was dead, for they thought, while the child was living, he wouldn't listen to us when we spoke to him. How can we now tell him that his child is dead? He may do something desperate. This is so codependent. We gotta understand this, right? This is so codependent right here. I mean, he was so upset. We couldn't possibly tell him the truth. We, couldn't, we can't possibly be honest with him. Yeah. We can't possibly help him any, so let's keep it from him because he might do something else. This isn't healthy. No. And people notice things. For instance, David noticed that his attendants were whispering amongst themselves, and he realized that the child was dead. Is the child dead, he asked. Yes, they replied. He is dead. And then David got up from the ground after he had washed 
and put on lotion. Listen, man, never underestimate the power of a good shower and put some lotion on your ashy knees and elbows. Come on, somebody. <laughs> Don't underestimate it. A good shower. I mean, listen, man, this dude was depressed. He was in bed for days. He stank. Wash yourself. And he changed his clothes. And he changed his clothes. Go get some Gucci. <laughs> Go get some Louis Vuitton. I mean, something nice. Go get something from the commons. I don't know. Like, put some nice clothes on. And then he went into the house of the Lord, and he worshiped. And then he went into his own house, and at his request, they served him food, and he ate. Now, yeah. see, now that one speaks to me. Yeah, man. Because I like me some food. No, I'm saying a little rock and pollo. A little paneer, chuleta. Come on, somebody else here. Some curry goat. Oxtail lima bean. Come on, somebody else here. Some fried chicken and collard greens. Come on, some, no? All right, for all the white people, hamburgers and hot dogs. <laughs> Feed yourself, man. Eat something. See, David stepped into his turning point. He made the great exchange. He took the, 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 the spirit of heaviness and exchanged it for a garment of praise. Now, I gotta talk to you about something. When we talk about this spirit of heaviness versus this garment of praise, a Christian, someone who's accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, they cannot be demon-possessed. You cannot be demon-possessed as a Christian. Uh, the Bible says this, no man can serve two masters. Yeah. Where the spirit of God abides, the spirit of Satan cannot abide. It can't, it can't happen, okay? So if you think that your loved one is demon-possessed, they're probably just bugging out at you. <laughs> they're probably just having an emotional breakdown. But what can happen is that there can be this essence or this spirit of heaviness. There can be a spirit of depression. There can be a spirit of sadness that can attach itself to you if you allow it and you continually meditate and think about that pain, right? So David has this great exchange. He says, all right, that's it. I'm done. I'm not staying in this grief anymore. I'm going to exchange this spirit of heaviness for the garment of praise. He went to the Lord's house and worshiped him. Jesus himself. He experienced grief. Jesus experienced all the pains common to man. In his humanity, he actually felt the pain of loss. Although only for a moment did his humanity, was it touched by grief, he too had to have a turning point. Yeah. The great exchange in order to move forward. In John 11, one through four, it speaks of a man named Lazarus. Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and Martha. This Mary, whose brother was Lazarus, was the one who poured the perfume on the Lord's feet and wiped them with her hair. Now listen, I'm gonna say this. I, just, I, think, I think Mary had a little crush on Jesus. <laughs> I do. Like the more I study it, I think she was sweet on Jesus. She, like, she loved Jesus, like loved him. All right, go ahead. I mean, it's extra. I wouldn't wipe your feet with my hair. Yeah, that's a lot. <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> Same. How are you going to wipe me when I'm old then? <laughs> Not with my hair. <laughs> Nasty. <laughs> so the sisters, they sent word to Jesus. Lord, the one that you love is sick. And when he heard this, Jesus said, the sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it. Remember that, all right? So this is verse four. A whole lot happens. They send word to Jesus. Your best friend, your brother, he's sick. Come now, take care of him. And Jesus says, this sickness will not end in death. Yep. So Jesus stays where he's at for five more days. He doesn't come. He doesn't come help. Jesus is only two miles away. He's two miles away. And he does, like, listen, he could walk there during dinner, heal his friend, and walk back and keep doing his job. Yeah. But he doesn't. Two miles away. Jesus says this won't end in death. Verse 17. We skipped a whole lot of what went on. 
And then on his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Four days he's been dead! Now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem. And many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him. But Mary had stayed home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus. No, 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 no. You know Martha wouldn't say it like that. (laughs) You got to now get into character. How would Martha say? Martha's mad. Martha's upset. Martha's confrontational. Martha was like, Jesus, you need to go tell Mary to come in here and help me cook. How did she just say this? (laughs) If you would have been here, my brother wouldn't have died. (laughs) So I don't think Martha would have said all Hispanic. (laughs) But okay, I get it. If you had been here. (laughs) But I know that even now. No, you have to say it (laughs) the way Martha would say it. I know even now God give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, You gotta say, Your brother will rise again. I know he'll rise again on the last day. No, you gotta say that. In the resurrection at the last day. I am the resurrection. <laughs> yo, he's, he, yo, he's coming hard. I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me, they will never die. Do you believe this? Yeah, whatever. (laughs) Yo, Martha is not matching the faith. She's like, yes, Lord, I believe that you're the Messiah, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. And then she has to bounce. She's like, I I can't even deal with you right now, right? Look, Mm -hmm. after she said this, she left. She went and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher's here. He's she asking said, for you. Yeah, he's asking for you. <laughs> he don't want to talk to me. Because I tried to give him the business, and he tried to fight with me, so he's asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went she to She got him. up quickly. <laughs> when she heard Jesus was asking about her, she was like, what? Jesus? <laughs> now, Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews had been with Mary in the house comforting her, they noticed how quickly she got up and went out. See, they noticed how quickly she bounced. (laughs) They followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. And when Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. So she's definitely coming at Jesus totally different. She's not coming at him like this. She's coming at him, you let me down. Mm-hmm. Like, I personally called for you, yeah. and you didn't text me back. You left me unread for four days. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come along with her weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. His humanity is touched in this moment. Where have you laid him, Jesus asks. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Shortest verse in the Bible. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him? But some of them said, Could not the one who opened the eyes of the blind have kept this man from dying? Ew. Ew. You choose this moment to take a shot at the guy? Yeah. Jesus, once more, deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, Jesus said. But Lord, Martha said, the sister of the dead man. By this time, there's a bad odor for he's been dead for four days. Then Jesus said, don't you remember verse four? Did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So he took away the stone that Jesus looked upon and said, 
looked up to heaven and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and the cloth around his face. And Jesus said to them, take off the grave cloths and let him go. Jesus said in verse four, this will not end in death, yet the man died. Jesus knew what he was going to do. He knew that he was always going to raise Lazarus from the dead, yet he still wept. Wept? Wept? Wept. Wept it? Wept. <laughs> Here's the big idea today. Just because you know the end of the story doesn't mean you can't cry at the sad parts. You ever watched the movie Titanic? You ever watched Notebook? Yo, the Notebook is such a dumb it's movie. Not. It's amazing. I cry, and I'm just saying it's dumb because I cry every time I watch it. I know what's going to happen. And I'm so. <laughs> and Titanic, you know Leonardo DiCaprio going to fall off the door. And she's like, Jack, Jack. But you still cry. <laughs> Jesus knew he was going to raise Lazarus from the dead. He knew that it was going to end in the glory of God. Yet, the humanity of the moment, the depths of despair around him, Brenda, now listen, we could totally over-spiritualize it. We could totally say, Jesus wept because of their lack of faith. Either way, my man felt it. We can't say that he was so divine that he wasn't human. His humanity felt the grips of the moment, the pain of that time. And him too, he had to choose a turning point. Jesus could have stayed weeping. He could have remained weeping. He could have chose, you know what, this is just too hard. I can't do this, forget it and stayed right there in a moment of sadness, in the moment of grief. But he said, no, I'm here for a bigger mission. We have to understand this, guys. We who are here and remain, life must go on. Yeah. Life must go on, and how must it go on? It must go on with joy and gladness. <laughs> All right, maybe not. Jesus wept. But I love this part of the story where it says this. Jesus calls him out of the grave and then he says this. He says, Lazarus, you need to have a turning point. He says, take off the grave cloth and let him go. Yeah. When it talked about David wearing the sackcloth and ash, sackcloth and ash were the garments of mourning, the garments of grief. They'd put on sackcloth and ash and they would actually wail so you got to take off the grave clothes. we got to take off the funeral clothes. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we can get comfortable in the grave clothes. Mm -hmm. We can get comfortable wearing the sackcloth and ash. We can get comfortable wearing the funeral clothes because it's easier to just stay dressed in this than to put on a new outfit. Yeah. In all honesty, it's easier to blame somebody mm -hmm or somebody else, or a situation, than just saying, I need to own this and move. Yep. Need to understand that there's nothing I can do or you can do, none of us can do, to change the past. The past is what it is. Mm -hmm. Can we learn from that and not repeat those same destructive behaviors? Mm -hmm. David spoke of this in Psalm uh, chapter 30. You have turned for me my mourning into dancing, mourning your grief. You have put off my sackcloth and clothed me with gladness to the end that my glory may sing praise to you and not be silent. O Lord, my God, I will give thanks to you forever. Turning point. This great exchange. This exchange of 
you're taking my sadness and turning it into dancing. And I'm gonna tell you, until you get to that place, when I was my hurt, most hurt and most mad and most angry, I'm telling you right now, I had no worship. I had no praise. You see me today on stage, just really just screaming my head off like Axl Rose from Guns N' Roses. <laughs> I, I, I worship today the way I do, the aggressive nature that I do, because there was years of my life that I couldn't do that. I physically could not make myself sing to God because I was happy that I loved him. I wasn't. And I was a pastor. I was a pastor, I was hurt. I couldn't sing. I mean, physically I could sing, but I didn't want to. There was no joy in my worship. There was no passion in my worship. Come on. Some of us, that's the great attack, is that your voice has been stolen, your worship's been stolen, your praise has been stolen. Because it's easier to stay angry, it's easier to stay hurt, it's easier to stay in the past, than to say, I am going to step into a garment of praise. The Bible says this, that his yoke is easy and his burden is light. If you're feeling a spirit of heaviness, then you don't have his burden that is easy and light. There needs to be a great exchange. And today, I wanna offer two things to you. Today, I wanna offer a great exchange. Your sin for his grace. Your failures, your mistakes, your past for his eternal life. It's the greatest exchange in all of humanity. But I wanna offer it on two levels today because I think we have two types of people in this room. The first one is the person who's never accepted Jesus Christ. You've never made Jesus Christ your Lord. You've never, what we call, converted to Christianity. Today would be like your biggest turning point. But then I also wanna talk to somebody in here today that you once were on fire for God. You once craved a relationship with God. And today you find yourself so far from God, you're asking yourself, who moved? Like, God, there is no joy to even serve you. Maybe I'm talking to somebody online. You're just like, I can't even get myself to get to church because I just have no desire to even come back there anymore. Maybe you need a turning point. Maybe you need the life of a living God breathe back into your spirit, man, once again. David said, return unto me the joy of my salvation and renew a right spirit within me. Maybe that's what you need today. And, and what we'd like to do is give you today's the date, right? So July 25th, 2021, it could be that day where he said, I recommitted my life back to Christ. And, and that was a turning point for me that I began to live for him in this new and living way. Here at Family Church, we pray a prayer to accept Jesus Christ in that way. And because we love you so much, we wanna pray it with you. And it goes like this, dear God, dear God I, come to you, I come to you, just like I am. Just like I, am. I, believe I believe that Jesus Christ, that Jesus Christ is, my Lord is my Lord and my Savior. And my Savior. Jesus, Jesus, I invite you, I invite you into, my life into my life to change me, to change me and to make me new. Make me Thank, you Thank you for accepting me, for accepting me. In, Jesus name. in Jesus' name, amen. 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 If you prayed that prayer for the very first time and you're watching online, uh, or, or you recommitted today, would you type amen in one of our chat rooms? One of our online hosts would love to connect with you and send you our six-day devotional called Starting Point. If you're in the room today and you either prayed that for the very first time or you recommitted today, would you allow me the honor to celebrate you for two seconds? I'm not gonna call you out of your seat or embarrass you or take you some back room. I just wanna celebrate you. Anybody here today pray that for the first time or a recommitment today? Would you wave at me real quick? Anybody? Yeah, I see you, yeah! Anybody? Else, real quick over here. Yeah, I see you. Yeah. Anybody else? Yeah, I see you in the back. Awesome. Awesome. Woo. We have that same starting point booklet at the Welcome Center if you want to grab a copy of that. Maybe you're here today and you're like, I don't really know about this Christianity thing. You're a really cute couple, but I'm still not sure about church. We have another book at the Welcome Center called Welcome Home. It's a little tiny book that talks about Christianity. 
what we believe. And at the end of that book, it's that exact same prayer that we just prayed. That's our free gift to you if you'd like to have that. It's right outside at the Welcome Center. Amen? Before we close out, we have a special announcement, and these two will close out service. <laughs> Thanks for watching today's message. My name is Pastor John Mark, and if this message has made an impact in your life in any way, I'd like to ask you to do a couple of things. We want you to like and subscribe to our channel and join us right here every Sunday at 9.30 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. The next thing I'm gonna ask you to do is to take your next step in your journey. We'd love to help you do that, and you can head over to FamilyChurchNY.com or email us at team at FamilyChurchNY.com to get started today.